All right, I'm going to deal with just a couple of chapters in Locke's second treatise this week because they're pretty important chapters. So I'm going to cover chapter 6 and chapter 7 of Locke's second treatise. And of course we're dealing with exactly what classical liberalism is by looking at its chief proponent, John Locke. So chapter 6 is of paternal power, that is, of the power of the father. So Locke is going to talk about the power of the father to the extent that it exists. So in this chapter, Locke is going to question the origin and the nature of power within the family. And he's going to question the idea that the, fa the father has an inherent superiority over the family. He's also going to distinguish power in the family, such as it exists, from political power. And once he's done demolishing uh, some misconceptions about power within the family as well as power in the political sense, he will then try to establish human relationships as free will or contractual and based on self-interest. So the overall point I want to get at regarding Locke's treatment of power is that in his political mode, Locke is aiming at hereditary monarchy. He's still trying to shoot that down and basically say that it is not some sort of natural and necessary form of political power and that other forms of power, other forms of political organization are better. But in the process also, Locke demolishes the traditional family um, at its very roots in the mentality of the traditional family as natural. And in fact, he wrecks any organic concept of community in the process of aiming at hereditary monarchy. He does this by establishing all human relationships, both within the family as well as in political society, as contractual and based on individual self-interest. You may ask yourself, why seeing the family and other relationships in terms of contract and self-interest somehow demolishes them. Well, it demolishes the older concept of family as natural and sort of organic growing out of, you know, the, the nature of things as somehow preordained and sacred. So I want people to understand how thoroughgoing it is that Locke um, takes these things on these notions of sacred, natural, organic relationships and dismantles them and turns instead to a very radically new and different way of looking at family and then also of looking at political power. People tend to think of British liberalism as some sort of staunch and super conservative way of thinking and what I want to show is that this way of thinking is the beginning of the deconstruction of the traditional way of life. This has its ironies because those who in our own day espouse the traditional way of life and family um, are most ardently attracted to John Locke and his influence on the founders, but it, it just so happens that Locke was a pretty revolutionary thinker all around. And if they looked a little closer, they'd see within Locke's ideas the seeds of what has come to be the disintegration of the family and community in our society. So the first question Locke asks is, is the power of the father natural in the family? Now, Aristotle, um, whom Locke is obviously very influenced by. You can see Aristotle's footprint all over Locke, mainly in how he disagrees, but sometimes agrees with Aristotle. Aristotle argued that uh, the man, as in the male, is naturally lord of the family. Nature ordained it. We see it everywhere. Aristotle generally took as evidence what he saw around him in the human world, in the in the uh, in the you know animal world, and he would go with what he what what prevailed, and he called that natural. So he argued that male leadership in the family was natural. But Locke comes out and argues that in nature 
Woman has an equal title to power over the children, equal to males, and even maybe more than equal, maybe more of a title, um, because woman knows where the children came from, for sure. Woman knows the children came from her. The woman may have more than one sexual partner, and so the title to the children is not as secure uh, from the male perspective. We have to understand nature is the standard for Locke. He tries to imagine what people would be like before or in um, the absence of government power, law, and order. And basically that becomes the standard for what is true, what is true even in civil society. So when Locke basically starts to argue that uh, there's no rational basis for male leadership within the family, he is, of course, aiming at hereditary monarchy, which passes through the male line whenever possible from the, the first son whenever possible and only goes to women if absolutely necessary. But he is also, at the same time, taking aim at the traditional ideas of family structure and, you know, where the authority comes from. Notion was normally, you know, first God uh, and then, you know, the, the male head of household, the priest also, you know, these male figures were authorities. Um, and Locke right away is simply... Um, taking that on and disagreeing. That doesn't make him some sort of weird proto-feminist, but I'm just saying it's a revolutionary way of looking at the family. So he says we really should be speaking of parental power rather than paternal power when it comes to the family in nature. Now he deals with the parental power over the children. And he says that there is equality in the state of nature due to roughly equal rational capacities and wills. So, I mean, the, 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 um, the way that Locke establishes human equality is through human beings' ability to reason. Um, he says, therefore, that there are some people within the human community that um, are not equal. Children are the first and foremost um, in that category. He says they're temporarily unequal because it takes time for them to develop. He mentions the age of 21, actually, but in other places he talks about at, at, the, at, at whatever age it is that they can actually take care of themselves and fend for themselves, which would probably in nature, um, at least before, you know, civilization got going real well, would be probably quite a bit younger than that. So he says, Parents have a natural power over their children until they reach that age of adequate reason where they can take care of themselves. And they have that power only in a tutelary way, he says, which means they have that power only in the sense that they are obliged to, to care for their children. Not to treat their children like slaves, but to care for their children because the children were brought into the world by them and they can't take care of themselves. Then he also mentions briefly that there are others who do not ever develop the capacity for mature reason and for whatever reason, and they may also continue to be under either their parental rule or somebody else's rule for the rest of their lives because they cannot um, completely manage their own lives. So, of course, the political point of this commentary about the family um, is at least that the authority over children ends when they become adults, and what we're dealing with when we form a political power are adults, and therefore they cannot be treated like children. So we can't liken the power of monarchs over citizens to parents over minor children. They're two different categories. Parents rule over children because the children's can't take care of themselves and they don't know how to reason well enough to prevent their imminent demise, that's not the case um, with adults. And so if monarchs rule or any government rules over citizens, it is not as a parent would over a child. And to do so, to make the appeal um, to this sort of paternal power, is to claim an illegitimate power over people. There is no father over a nation in Locke's view. Locke says, in summary, the want of distinguishing these two powers, 
that is that which the father hath in the right of tuition, that is, bringing up the children, during minority, that is, under age, and the right of honor all his life may perhaps have caused a great part of the mistakes about this matter. What he means by that is, he says, children always uh, owe their parents honor because the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. But they don't owe their parents obedience always. They only owe them obedience until they can fend for themselves. So then in this same chapter, 6, he, he has to answer the question, well, then why do we have all these monarchies? Why, where, where did they come from and how did they arise? Well, he says it, was, it would be pretty normal if the, um, especially the fathers, since that seems to happen most of the time, if the father's uh, wisdom was credible um, and, you know, so that it impressed upon people, especially the children, um, the notion that the father was competent to judge, it would be fairly normal for the children to continue in obedience and deference to the elders' wisdom because it worked. Also, and in addition to that, fathers, the older they get, have more control over more property, at least potentially. And if they do, then they have that to wield. And remember, pop property can happen even within the state of nature because money has developed in the state of nature. And you can enclose more land than um, that you can grow things in and raise things in than you could possibly consume. So, you know, to the extent that these lands are controlled by fathers or parents, then the children may, may agree out of self-interest to continue to obey and to work with their parents because it makes sense in order to obtain the uh, goods that come from the estate and maybe to, to obtain the estates themselves after their parents pass. So the upshot of all this is that it's understandable in Locke's view that monarchies developed, but... They are not to be seen as some sort of inevitable thing. They're not to be seen as something that is divinely ordained or is that somehow it's the only natural um, source of authority. But they are to be understood as a product of consent. Uh, they, they only are as good as the agreements that are made, that continue to be made, if nothing else, tacit consent, meaning the consent, the consent that you give by staying there and cooperating. They're only as good as that consent. Uh, there's no, no sort of mystical um, authority of any sort of spiritual nature uh, or nature of magnetism that keeps people in these arrangements. So monarchies aren't the only legitimate kind of government. And in fact, they're the least likely to be a legitimate kind of government because oftentimes, as we'll see as we move along, monarchies um, claim to have this sort of natural and permanent and completely um, indestructible authority over people. And in Locke's view, this is a dangerous thing. It's it's a threatening thing that needs to be challenged and overturned. So then Locke turns to political or civil society. And he's going to talk about what's the difference here? What makes political or civil society different from the, the family? So he starts out with a society that exists between man and wife in nature. And then also between parents and children. And then finally between master and servant. Uh, this follows Aristotle's um, view of things quite closely, but he's going to see it differently than Aristotle does. Aristotle says that the first natural political community is between a man and a woman, and then between parents and children and master and servant. Um, but the difference is going to be that Aristotle see these, sees these things as natural because we are um, a social creature, and like other animals, we naturally develop these relationships. Um, whereas, again, Locke is going to say that e all of these are contractual. All of these are a matter of, of, of choice and consent. Master and servant being a matter of consent, he's also going to deal with master and slave, which is not, and he will say, 
it's a state of war. So for those of you who thought that John Locke was wholesome and wonderful when it comes to all things and in, um, in a good spot relative to the American founding, which was about also wholesome things. <laughs> um, so Locke has a pretty revolutionary view of marriage. It's very interesting. I pulled a quote or two from this chapter. Locke says in chapter 7, conjugal society, which is marriage, is made by a voluntary compact between a man and a woman, and though it consists chiefly in such a communion and right in one another's bodies as is necessary to its chief end, procreation, yet it draws with it mutual support and assistance and a communion of interests too, as necessary not only to unite their care and affection, but also necessary to their common offspring who have a right to be nourished and maintained by them till they are able to provide for themselves. So, so far, not too terribly shocking. Marriage is a compact or an agreement between a man and a woman. So it is a voluntary agreement. It's not some sort of, so it's not a spiritual institution ordained by God as much as it is a contract or agreement. So that's that's one thing that kind of stands out. Um, also, though, and more traditionally, its chief end is procreation, the making of babies. And the reason why it continues is the maintenance of offspring for their care and affection. But now here's where Locke should give us some pause if we're thinking of him and his classical liberal theory as an upholder of traditional relationships or even um, the idea of eternal bonds, let's say, because he is not in support of the eternal bond of marriage. And this is a fundamental relationship uh, in society. Again, he says in chapter 7, this conjunction betwixt, which is between, male and female ought to last even after procreation, so long as is necessary to the nourishment and support of the young ones who are to be sustained by those that got them till they are able to shift for themselves, meaning till they're able to take care of themselves. Um, and Locke goes on in the next paragraph to discuss various animals, herbivores, carnivores, whatever, um, who, you know, will stay with their parents and their parents will stay together long enough for them to be off the mother's milk until they can feed themselves, which in some cases is a few months or maybe a year or less. Um, and then the parents, in other words, are then free to go. And in the animal kingdom, Locke observes many times, parents only get together to procreate. Only the mother stays with the offspring. But at the most, they both stay with the offspring until the offspring wanders away to start its own life. Um, and then they're dissolved. Not every animal does this, as we know. But a lot of them do, and Locke, interestingly, seems to be taking some of his cues from the animal kingdom here. So marriage is not inviolable, it's not sacred, it's not everlasting in this view from the natural point of view. Uh, Locke still speaking of people as they operate in nature, that is the standard of, of what is true for human beings. He says, and herein I think lies the chief, if not the only reason, why the male and female in mankind are tied to a longer conjunction than other creatures. That is because the female is capable of conceiving and de facto is commonly with child again and brings forth to a new birth long before the former is out of a dependency for support on his parents' help and able to shift for himself. So the re in other words, the reason why most human um, relationships between the male and the female last longer than the sometimes very momentary conjoining of animals in the animal kingdom is because um, the child takes longer to gestate in a human than once it comes out. It takes years for it to become an independent being and by that time probably the woman has gotten pregnant again and so it can be like decades 
uh, where they're in the business of taking care of at least one child that cannot fend for itself. And this is the reason why human relationships of marriage uh, last as long as they do. He concludes, whereby the father who is bound to take care of those who he hath begot, those children he has made, is under an obligation to continue in conjugal marital society with the same woman longer than other creatures whose young being able to subsist of themselves, the conjugal bond dissolves of itself and they are at liberty since Hymen at his usual anniversary season summons them uh, till he summons them again to choose new mates. So basically Locke is saying that uh, parents should stay together long enough to raise the last of their offspring, but once they're, the last of their offspring is taking care of himself, there is no reason why the parents should stay together or need to stay together. They are then free to go their own way if they want to. Um, it is a, an arrangement for the uh, upbringing of the children. Now, as far as power within the marriage, uh, Locke says oftentimes it falls to the father, whether it's in nature or whether it's in civil society, because he says the husband is often the abler and the stronger. That's language right out of Aristotle. So he, fathers, he follows Aristotle there. And so in marriage, he says, the final decision often falls to him when it comes to what to do with what is in common, the common property. But he says, what is the wife's property that she brings into the marriage or that she obtains on her own remains under her jurisdiction, which is kind of a revolutionary thought as well, because under law, as I understand it, whatever women brought into their marriage became their husbands by law. So Locke is saying, no, you know, what in, as far as nature goes, is what is natural and true is that the wife re retains what she herself has within the contract unless she, unless she willingly cedes it to her husband. And he says in the marriage, the husband is so far from being a monarch over the wife that the wife, quote, has many cases, in many cases, a liberty to separate from him where natural right or their contract allows it, so in nature as well as in civil society, depending whether that contract be made by themselves in the state of nature or by the customs or laws of the country they live in. Now, while all this may sound really good and progressive and everything, it is the seed of a different way of thinking about human relationships, which has thoroughly taken root in our society, in which we see every human relationship as a matter of contract between and among individuals that will be retained as long as it is in the interest of every individual, but can be easily um, dismantled and abandoned if it is not in the interests of any of the individuals. And one could argue that without that sacred gloss on such a thing as marriage, that you're going to get more and more disintegration of marriage. And one could argue that marriage being a fundamental part of community, um, at least in a lot of societies, that such thinking is erosive, or, yeah, erosive of community cohesion. Now, of course, the political point Locke is trying to make is that even if even family relationships are contractual and therefore revocable, how much more should political arrangements be seen as contractual and revocable? Even more so, because they're made uh, by uh, individuals, free adult individuals, who are only coming into some sort of arrangement in order to obtain their self-interest and don't even have any sort of um, ties related to uh, minor children, uh, any sort of moral obligation to take care of anybody else. So of course, political arrangements should be seen as very much a matter of contract and therefore revocable. So for political society, Locke sees that it is among free and equal adults who voluntarily quit or leave their natural power in the state of nature, and they give that power into the so-called hands of the community, 
That is, through the social contract, they give the power out of their individual hands into the hands of the group and agree to be governed by its laws in some arrangement that they all agree to. They agree to resign their private judgments so they will no longer be um, you know, judge and jury in their own case, and they will allow the community to judge. So the community comes to be the umpire of their disputes, and it comes to be the defender of all against those who might threaten them. So it can um, call upon the aid of all who have agreed to the contract to defend all. So you can see this is the origin of the legislative and the executive power. The legislative to make the laws, to make the rules under which everybody will live according to arrangements that everyone has agreed to. And the executive power, the ability to carry those laws out and enforce them. Again, what Locke is aiming at is a criticism of absolute monarchy. He wants to argue that it is inconsistent with true civil society because it is not voluntary, because it is imposed upon people with this argument that it is natural and paternal and God-ordained. But true civil society is among voluntary, agreeing adults. So Locke is going to argue that absolute monarchy is in a state of war with its subjects, much like slaves are in a state of war with their masters, because an absolute monarch has enough power that it can take your property through taxation as well as do, through direct confiscation with its army. It can also take your life because of that. So you are in a position vis-a-vis -vis the absolute monarch like a slave is relative to his master, and that's a state of war. At any point, if you can get out of it, you will, because you do not want to be controlled and be that vulnerable. This is all setting us up for Locke's argument that we have a right to revolution. So he rejects unequivocally here Thomas Hobbes's idea of a social contract in which people voluntarily cede all of their rights, except for their right to self-preservation, to an absolute monarch. Locke says no absolute monarch could ever be voluntarily agreed to because an absolute monarch has too much power and is too much of a threat to our lives. All right, so we see some of the implications of Locke's theory. Obviously, we know that Locke was trying to argue for a revolutionary new idea of government and a rejection of divine right and absolute monarchy. But along the way, he is taking aim at some of the traditional notions of family that had sustained marriage for centuries and also sustain the idea of community within society. And he's gonna substitute for those organic, natural, traditional type ideas, the idea of individual choice through contract. And it's an open question whether that type of bond, a bond based on self-interest amongst individuals can replace this other type of bond, this earlier type of bond, in which some relationships were simply deemed natural and even had a sort of aura of holiness. All right, see you next time. Bye.